Welcome back to MinAdopt's podcast, Let's Talk. Today we would like to welcome Mariah Rooney. Mariah is a licensed clinical social worker who specializes in treating complex challenges that arise as a result of traumatic stress, attachment trauma, intergenerational trauma, and dissociation. She has extensive experience in working with foster parents, pre and post adoptive parents, and other caregivers to help them understand the complex impact of developmental trauma and attachment disruptions. Her focus on strengthening and supporting the caregiver child relationship through deepening the understanding of the child helps caregivers better meet the child's emotional and behavioral needs and fosters repair and building of healthy attachment in families. Today, Mariah and I will be discussing how to find more compassion and space during this uncertain time in our family and communities. Welcome. Hi, Mariah. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for being here with us today. Oh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So if you could share a little bit more, um, you were talking about parts of ourselves. Um, if you want to share a little bit more about what you mean by that so people have a framework um, understanding of what we're talking about today, that'd be yeah. great. Of course. You know, one of the ways that I often start talking about parts with people is by just kind of reminding us that we actually pretty naturally talk about ourselves in terms of parts pretty, pretty frequently, but we don't always notice it. So an example would be, you know, think of the last time that you said something you're like, well, a part of me wants this and a part of me wants that, or, you know, a part of me is feeling this way and a part of me is feeling that way. And really, you know, while there are a variety of different ways of understanding and thinking about parts, what we're saying is that we have different parts of us that show up in different spaces and roles and relationships um, for very different reasons. You know, it can be how we hold and think about inner conflict or kind of incongruence that we experience internally. Um, you might think about a part of you that shows up work that, at work that maybe doesn't show up at home or a part of your kid that shows up at school that, that is different than a part of your kid that you engage with at home. And it's just a way for us to think about how we develop different parts of ourselves and our identities so that we can be, you know, the nuanced, complex and kind of versatile people that we need to be in our relationships and in the world. So I'm guessing that different parts of us might show up behaviorally differently, or we might have different physical reactions that could tell a story in different situations. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that might show up like right now for families, especially yeah. with caregiver and child relationships in this, yeah. during this time. Yeah, you know, I do, I do try to integrate parts work into my work with caregivers and also into my, into my clinical work with kids and families, because I think it can be a really cool way to breathe a little spaciousness into the relationship, particularly into moments when things are, are maybe tense or difficult. Um, it can also bring in a whole bunch of self-compassion and compassion for other people when you're able to have a little bit of distance between kind of viewing a whole person as, you know, if you think about if you're, if you're with your kid and your kid's having a really tough time and they're really dysregulated, it might feel in certain moments like that is the entirety of your kid is this like big intense behavior, this big intense feeling and taking this kind of an approach actually helps you start to separate the behavior, the big feeling from the person a little bit. And, and so one way that I think about it in answer to your question is that, you know, we can even think of a behavior as the, the behavior of a part or a, you know, a physiological reaction, something that's happening in our body as a part of us or a part of our kid that's showing up in that moment for some reason. And we might be able to then get really curious about like, okay, well, this is cluing me into something that maybe something feels a little out of the norm. Maybe you're not feeling like your best self or your kid's not maybe looking or feeling like their best self. So how can we be curious about what part is showing up and why? You know, one example I'll give people is like for adults, if you think about, you know, there might be certain people in your life, maybe a parent or a caregiver or a parental you know, type person in your life that when you're around them, all of a sudden you start acting like a teenager again, or you get a little feisty or a little grumpy. Well, that's a shift, right? And, and that's an example of how we can kind of tune in and be like, what's that about? Like, why might this be happening? And usually people can connect with that. I, don't, I know I surely can. I know that sometimes that's how I definitely feel when I'm around um, my parents. It's like, whoa, like, did I just slip back into my 15 year old self? Like, where did that <laughs> comment come from? You know? 
Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I can relate to that. Definitely. Um, can you tell, talk a little bit more maybe about the physical reactions that might come with different parts? Um, how might a caregiver check in with themselves about, oh, I think this, I have this part showing up for myself right now that I, I'm surprised by. What kind of physical sensations might they tune into to know that that's happening for them? Yeah. Well, it's a great question. I think in general, it, it's kind of a practice of just tracking your your kind of inner sensory landscape and what's happening in your body and how that clues you into maybe what you might be needing. And sometimes that clues us in that something is shifting for our ki for a kid, for example, or for one of our um, family members before something even shows up in front of us. So I think about um, you know, if we stay, if we stay with this kind of teenager, if an adult shifting into kind of a teenager part around their parents, if we stay with that example for a second, maybe when you're like driving up to your parents' house, if you were really tuning into yourself, you might notice that, oh, like you have a little tension in your body or you start to feel a little anxious, something along those lines, um, or you notice some sensation in your throat. What does that tell you about how your body might be already kind of anticipating what's going to happen? And we can definitely pick up on that, I think, energetically, when, particularly when we're around kids. If we can feel like, oh, they're starting to shift a little bit, like maybe they're starting to have a hard time, we might also be able to track something in our body and then help kids start to track and notice that, notice that too. And I think about a kid that I worked with who was really able to identify this, like, I think, this big angry part that felt really big and he would talk about right before he kind of shifted into that part he would notice a lot of the kind of tingly sensation and energy in his hands um, and it was something that we were able to notice over time and then figure out what to do with his hands and with that sensation to kind of help him regulate a little bit that is really helpful um could you speak a little bit more about maybe how caregivers can help kids check in with themselves? You know, kids are um, learning how to do this and how can caregivers help them check in about what's yeah. happening in their bodies? Yeah, you know, the first thing that I always talk to caregivers about is model it first. Because when we have the experience of doing it ourselves, we can model that for the children in our lives. You know, we can, we can, one, we can understand what it is that we're talking about if we're asking them to do something and we're being good models in that way. But we're attuning to ourselves, which helps us better attune to other people and to kids. So, you know, I'll think of, you know, if you're, let's say that you start to notice a shift in yourself, you're like, oh gosh, like I, um, today's been a really tough day. Like we've all been in this space together for thinking about right now, like families being in, you know, close quarters together. Like we all had a lot going on. It was kind of a stressful day. Like I'm noticing like, Oh, I just feel super tight and tense up in my back. Like, Oh, do you ever feel that way when you're having a hard time or it's been a stressful day? You can offer kind of a narrative of your own experience to model and then use that as an invitation to check in with your kids um because i think it, it kind of helps you join in that experience and normalizes it quite a bit yeah that's a great way to check in with kids is to tell a little bit of a story about what's happening for you so that then maybe they feel more open and telling a story about what's happening for themselves yeah, yeah, sort of tuning into what's going on with them mm -hmm. can you give um some examples of how a caregiver might be able to step back from some of these situations where kids are feeling some really big emotions and then caregivers are feeling really big emotions. Um, how can caregivers do that, especially in this space right now where maybe caregivers don't have a, a place to go to do that or they, they can't leave the house? And um, what are some tricks that you can maybe share um, for our yeah. audience today? Yeah, you know, it, this is tricky, right? We don't have a lot of physical space right now. We don't have a lot of energetic space. We don't have a lot of space with our time. And so um, this is one way that I think about creating internal space and also creating space in relationships. So let's say your kid, your kid's starting to have a really tough time. They're starting to get a little dysregulated. Um, maybe they're kind of throwing stuff around or smashing stuff around. Now, one thing, and this takes practice, right? This doesn't happen overnight. You don't snap your fingers and then suddenly start kind of showing up in this way. It takes a, a practice of noticing and being curious kind of over and over again. But you might, in that moment, ask yourself like, oh, like, what part of me shows up when my kid shows like this? Is Do you find yourself really quickly moving into kind of like a fight or flight response 
and maybe your voice changes, your tone gets, your volume gets louder, your tone shifts, you get upset, maybe you yell, and then suddenly you can step back. And before anything else, you can ask yourself like, all right, whoa, 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 like what part of me just showed up and why? Um, because our parts also show up in response to kids. And so that can be one way. Another way is to kind of hold that question of like, what part of my kid is showing up in front of me right now? You know, and I'll, if we go back to this example that I shared of this, this um, kiddo that identified this big angry part of himself that, you know, we were able to work in that family system to think about um, what does the big angry part need and why is it showing up? Because it also, every single part of us really we can welcome because it has a purpose, it has a function, it's showing up for a reason. And for this kid, it was usually because he was feeling really unheard or there was some misattunement happening between a teacher and the kid or or his caregiver and, and him. And it was an invitation then for them, for this family to check in and be like, okay, I know when the angry part shows up, big angry, um, that we're like, out of, we're out of step here. You know, like our rhythm is off here. And so we need to take a step back, breathe for a minute, and then get curious about what to do from that place. Instead of trying to shut down big angry, it was actually like getting closer to it and saying, oh, like you're telling me, that you're having a hard time because I'm missing something here or we're not connecting in the way that we normally do or would like to. Does that answer your question? It does. Um, you know, I, I, I love how you talk about that we can embrace all parts of us, that, that they all, that they serve a purpose, right? They're, they're giving us information about what we might need and about what our kids might mean, might, might need. Um, I do want to ask you, I mean, some of our listeners certainly understand what attunement means and fight and flight means. And, and some people that are listening, that might be, those might be new concepts for them. And I'm wondering if you could just break that down a little bit for our audience today. Yeah, yeah. So attunement is really just, you know, how are we in rhythm or out of rhythm with, with ourselves and one another? That's one way that I think about it. It's like when you think about the moments when you just feel super synced up with your kid or with yourself, you're like, you're, you're, you're feeling clear about how you're feeling and how they're feeling and communication is going well. There's like a natural kind of rhythm and connection where even if your kid is having a tough time, we can attune in a way that is rhythmic and in sync, right? So it's like, okay, like you're in front of me, you're having a tough time. And maybe I'm kind of reflecting that back to you or responding in a way where your kid is actually able to take it in. I think that is a really good example of what it means to be kind of attuned and, and can I think of it as connection like authentic solid healthy loving compassionate connection that even if we have a whole bunch of other feelings that are flying around that the foundation of it is is that connection um and then fight or flight you know it's really um you know thinking about how we get kind of hijacked or we get really reactive when um, things, you know, consciously or unconsciously maybe feel kind of scary or um, we feel threatened in some way, even if it's not like a real kind of explicit scary threat, it can just be a threat to our, you know, kind of sense of ease or content in that moment. Maybe it's a, it's a, 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 we feel really worried and we kind of go into that state of being reactive and trying to figure out um, how are we going to, um, you know, kind of make it through that moment or get to the other side, but it, but it, it feels um, a little yeah, reactive. I think that's the word I want to, I want to say, and it's off, it can very much be a trauma response and it also can just be kind of a, a state of being a little overwhelmed. Our systems, our bodies are a little overwhelmed. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, I was just thinking a little bit about when you were talking about um, the, the description about um, sort of feeling a little bit like a teenager when you're going to see your parents. And I think about that as I, we're hearing a lot from a lot of our families that they're seeing um, regression in their kids. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how parents or caregivers might meet those needs when they see their kids regressing or acting younger than their chronological age? How can caregivers um, connect with their kids in that way? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I have this conversation a lot. Um, and actually of late, there's been a lot of conversation, I think, with 
um, with caregivers of adolescents where we've talked about how in some moments suddenly they're, they're sitting with a, a 16 year old that feels like they're eight or seven and the parents are like, what is going on? They're asking me to do things for them that, you know, I haven't done for them in years or aren't really age appropriate or, um, the, you know, and, and one thing that we talk about is what does it tell you about a part of your kid that's maybe showing up in that moment and, and has a different need that's trying to get met, you know? So um, is it in that moment kind of telling you that your kiddo is needing um, something that, that feels a little bit younger and it can be, it can very much be because they're, they're having a hard time. It can be in a, an attachment seeking thing where they're trying to connect with you differently or, I think when I work with foster and adoptive families, sometimes it's a kid trying to have an experience, you know, unconsciously that they didn't get to have with that caregiver or, um, you know, that they're needing to have again because they're having a really hard time and it's, and, you know, and then attuning in to that and connecting with that can be a really beautiful opportunity to support and build attachment and to create some kind of rhythm and connection in the relationship and to help attend to that part of that part of the kid that is just showing up trying to get trying to get a need met in some way. So if I'm hearing you correctly, it's okay for parents and caregivers to meet that younger need. That that's not sort of giving in or acquiescing. It's really creating a stronger attachment, a stronger yeah. connection, and hopefully quieting that part down so that the kids kids or teenagers are can become more regulated. Absolutely. You know, you and I talked about this recently and an example that I shared with you, I think, is thinking about dating, right? Or like being in a new romantic relationship that mm -hmm. sometimes we're like, why am I showing up in this way? I feel like I'm a teenager again, or mm -hmm. I'm like trying to do something with this person that I've actually done before. But, but like, and that, to me, that's a great example of that is that we want to have those experiences with this new person um in our lives even if we've had that experience before or even if it feels like kind of a younger thing or a younger need we're really just mm -hmm. trying to build connection and foster relationship with this person by having a variety of different experiences with them uh, and that's just one of the reasons why you know we might do something like that but i think it's a good example and one that adults can often connect with connect with too yeah that's really yeah that that really breaks it down really well well, we are almost out of time. Um, I just want to thank you for being here today and and sharing, you know, a little bit with our caregivers and families out there about how they can create a little bit more space and connection. And um, yeah, so thanks for being here, Mariah. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm so grateful that you all are doing this and interested in having these. If you are wanting more information about the conversation that we had today, you can go to www.mn adopt.org and click on the tab for the help program and there are lots of resources there for families that relate to regulation and attunement and parts and all of the things that we discussed today and if you want to reach out to the help program at 612-746-5137 we would be happy um, to chat with you and help you connect to resources that we have here at MinAdopt. Thank you.